So we're here with author and journalist Seth Mnookin, um, who has written a book called The Panic Virus, A True Story of Science, Medicine, and Fear. Did I get that right? Medicine, Science, and Fear. Medicine, right. Science, and Fear. Words, right? uh, okay, so it's rough, that's roughly the uh, title. So, And Seth just did a very interesting hour on farm with Michael Krasny, so we just wanted to do a little follow-up for our news blog. Um, Seth, can you just briefly um, tell us what the uh, thesis of your book is? What is it about? Sure. Um, uh, it's a book I, I started working on um, just because I would hear a lot, I was hearing a lot of my friends about concerns that vaccines were causing autism or other developmental disorders. Um, I didn't have any kids at the time, and, and it wasn't something I had looked into, but um, what struck me was that these, this was a peer group um, that most of the time was very science-based um, when you were talking about uh, evolution versus creationism or global warming or they were very insistent that we had to listen to the evidence. Um, and even though when I started research I had no idea where the evidence lay, uh, what struck me was that all of these people um, that I was talking with were saying you know, I'm going on my gut on this. I'm, I'm, I'm using my intuition to make this decision. And I was curious as to why that was about this issue. Um, and then it became like, you know, a, a thread on a sweater that I pulled on and three years later I woke up and was still working on it. So, right. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I got a little bit interested in this issue because we have a two-year-old right. and when we took our uh, kid to the pediatrician, sort of on the, uh, one of the first questions she asked us was, how do you feel about vaccinations? Right. right. And we said, what do you mean? She said, well, are you going to be wanting to getting, you know, the full vote of vaccinations? And I said, well, yeah, I think so. Right. Well, what is the issue? And she said, well, a lot of parents um, are opting out. And I mean, I guess I had heard of that, but I didn't realize it, it to right. the extent where, you know, the pediatrician would actually ask you, um, proactively, and so I started looking into it and have since found that Marin County is sort of a hotbed of this yeah. activity, and I just looked at your piece in Newsweek that talked about the link between affluent communities and opting out of uh, vaccines. So can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah, and I think it's it's probably similar to where you are to, to my neighborhood in Brooklyn. Um, uh, at one point a couple of years ago, right after uh, there had been a, a measles outbreak in San Diego. I was talking to someone in the, in the California State Department of Health, and um, I said, how do you, is there any way you can identify communities or areas that might be particularly at risk of having either low vaccine uptake or outbreaks? And he said, um, uh, you know, I take a map and I look wherever there's a Whole Foods, and I put a pin in the map and, and I draw a circle around it. Um, uh, and I sort of laughed, assuming that he was was joking. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess in a very literal sense he was joking, but um, he said we identify communities with um, a higher median income, with uh, a high, very high degree of college uh, uh, graduates or graduate school graduates. Um, so it does, it tends to be, uh, more concentrated in the type of um, communities uh, for which I, I think, like the term helicopter parenting was probably invented. You know, uh, parents who are very involved with um, uh, every aspect of their children's life and feel like everything is, they can control everything. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, that's interesting. So do you think that is basically the reason between, uh, that's the link between sort of the affluence and, you know, the opt-out? These are people right. who are, are kind of well-informed on some level, but they're trying to um, use that information to just control things in their lives that to some extent maybe aren't necessarily controllable. Well, I, you know, I think um, autism is uh, something about which we are much more aware of than, you know, probably when, when you or I, um, uh, you know, were, were, were teenagers or it was sort of like um, my knowledge of autism didn't extend much further than Rain Man. Um, and and, and he, the, the person who that was based on actually wasn't even autistic. Um, but, uh, and now I think it's something that we as a, a, as a society are much more aware of um, uh, parents, a lot of parents know that 
the rates, incident rates are increasing and don't know why, because we don't know why. Um, and uh, this is, uh, because vaccines have been effective, um, I think our generation uh, doesn't have the, the sort of first person um, awareness of the risks of some of these diseases. So you combine all of that and, you know, uh, I, I can understand why a parent would think, well, why am I, you know, if I, if I, I don't know anyone who's uh, had been hospitalized for measles, I know all of these families that are dealing with, with autism, um, why should I just take what, you know, the government or the medical community is telling me and, and just do what they say, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of forge this other path. Right. Now, apparently, um, the, the sort of what I guess is now basically being determined to be a myth, it, right. uh, the genesis of this was a study that uh, was later found to be fraudulent in 1998. Um, yeah, the... Uh, and yes and no. I mean, yes, the study was recently, the, well, the study that you're talking about was a 1998 um, study in the journal The Lancet uh, that was the uh, really the first time that um, autism specifically had been linked to vaccines. And, this, and that study was about the um, measles, mumps, rubella, the MMR vaccine. Um, and it involved 12 children. Um, uh, that study has, has since been retracted by the, by the journal by, um, uh, I think, either 10 or 11 of the 13 authors. Um, the, lead, the lead writer on that study lost his medical license. Um, but that was, I think, sort of the point at which these fears about autism really took hold. And it, it, it's one of the reasons I titled the book The Panic Virus, because I think what has happened here is um, it's an illustration of how once sort of a fear gets spread, it's much, much harder to get rid of it than it is to start it. It's sort of like, you know, razor blades and apples or something. Um, right. Once it's in your mind, it's very, very hard to then, even if someone says, oh, that's definitely not true, to sort of fully rid yourself of that fear. It's like, you know, whatever you do, don't think of the word elephant. Um, and then that's all you can do is think of the word elephant. Um, uh, but since then, there have been a number of, of other theories that have been put forward um, uh, related to vaccines and autism. And every time one of them is uh, sort of disproven, um, uh, you know, vaccine opponents then raise another one. So it, it's ended up becoming a, a, a sort of game of, um, of, of whack-a-mole.